Uh, thanks. Thanks, Brett. Um, so yeah, just kind of, uh, going to keep it a high level. And then for a Q and a, we can kind of maybe do a little more cater to the audience. Uh, if we want to talk more, uh, procurement energy supply generation markets or, or actual, you know, facility design, uh, construction sequencing, uh, you know, any technical, uh, features of the actual equipment. Uh, we'll, we'll kind of maybe get into the more details in the QA section. But with, with that said, I just want to uh, thank you guys for uh, having us here. Um, you know, SDU is happy to share this information uh, where we're able to. So uh, definitely want our partner utilities, uh, other utilities in the country to kind of be informed about energy storage systems because uh, it just helps your customers. It helps the market uh, in, in general. Uh, having the same expectations from our vendors uh, and just kind of looking for common pitfalls. Again, uh, we're just going to kind of go through some of the larger projects that sdg &E has constructed in recent history, just so you kind of get a taste of uh, what we've done and what we've built and what we're operating here uh, for you guys to kind of be informed and ask questions um, about. Uh, so with that said, let's, let's do this. So, um, this is a slightly outdated slide, but th these are kind of uh, some of the, the, the systems we have sprinkled throughout uh, San Diego County. Um, you know, we're going to speak to like some of the larger facilities um, today. Escondido was our first like large, large scale battery. Escondido and El Cajon, they were built as part of the expedited storage project initiative uh, directed by the California Public Utilities Commission in 2016. Uh, they were built in basically a year time frame um, on, on substation parcels, uh, basically adjacent to substations uh, for, for quick interconnects. Um, but ever since then, uh, most of our projects have kind of been under different, um, they've been proposed under different generation solicitations that the sdg &E Energy supply side of the company has run where my development team effectively um, develops cost estimates, proposals, runs our own little mini solicitations with the battery vendors or any other um, service vendors that would be providing scope to develop these projects. We bundle it all up. We submit it to them for contemplation against, you know, their IPP independent power producer solutions or merchant solutions uh, to feed the sdg &E uh, energy supply uh, requirements. <clears throat> and so what we were really seeing, I guess, in the, the, the lot of 20 teens, uh, there, there was, you know, a lot of contemplation about uh, storage. Uh, there was just really the expedited storage product kind of kicked off the marketplace. Uh, a lot of the storage solutions weren't cost effective against the traditional conventional um you know, generation solutions. And so, um, you know, in the advent of, I guess, you know, the, the downturn of the ITCs from wind and solar and uh, the, I guess, loss of a lot of conventional generation, right? The removal, uh, revoking of existing permits for rank and style uh, natural gas plants, um, diesel plants. Uh, it's kind of spurred the resource adequacy market. There's a lot of Demand in California is probably a lot of the audience is aware uh, for just generation capacity, right? Last year, we had a 20 megawatt, I believe, excess supply for for a couple of days on, on a couple like hour periods at peak um, back to back during our heat waves where we were very close to rolling brownouts just because of the lack of generation in the state. And so uh, given the amount of generation that's shut down, that's not really a surprise to us in the industry. But, you know, I think the commission and the California independent system operator uh, have basically recognized the need that we need to get some more generation on the system uh, for reliability purposes. And so they've done a couple waves of procurement over the last uh, five years uh, since, I've, since, since I've kind of been with this development group. And so a lot of these batteries are a result in that. And we have a lot more in the pipeline uh, that are getting kind of bigger and bigger in nature. Right now, this week, we're actually commissioning Westside Canal, which is our 131 megawatt 
battery out in El Centro, uh, connected to SCG&E's Imperial Valley substation. It's actually at the edge of our system. It's outside our service territory, but it connects to our transmission substation uh, via Imperial Irrigation District Gentile line. Uh, so that one's pretty exciting. We'll, we'll show some drawings for that facility at the end of the presentation. So these are some, some pictures. There's some pretty rough pictures. I apologize. Uh, uh, as you know, we got a little uh, blurry, uh, you know, one on the right here. But, you know, you kind of get the feel for these Gen 1 units where a lot of them were packaged up in, I would call it, you know, reverse engineered connexes or shipping containers. That was kind of where the industry started. We actually have had, we had some batteries that were built as part of uh, Epic, uh, which is CEC kind of R&D uh, initiative projects as early as 2011, um, that our sister group, the Distributed Energy Resource uh, Group was working on. They were, they were batteries that were put on the system to be paired with kind of uh, high penetration uh, solar circuits, uh, rooftop solar circuits uh, to perform microgrid functions or just load shaving functions on distribution circuits. Um, and so, uh, you know, that was kind of the, you know, the, the onset of energy storage in general. And then a lot of them were put in these connexes as well. Um, but so these, these units in particular, that all the inverters were integrated inside the same enclosures. Um, most of the topology has kind of gotten away from that. There's, there's different schools of thought of over what is advantageous, what is not. Um, currently, most of our inverters are kind of self-contained and are external to uh, the, the battery enclosures because you have kind of different environmental conditions you need to maintain for that equipment versus the actual battery modules. Um, and, and you have a lot more heat output from the inverters of the power conversion systems themselves. Uh, so we'll go through that, but a lot of those are close couple to uh, these transformers you kind of see on the left there, and they just have DC cabling into these containers. That's more typical output. But this was a 30 megawatt system, uh, effectively connected to three different distribution circuits that aggregated to a SC distribution bank. Uh, not the most optimal topology. There was a big heartburn over these HVACs that were put on these roofs. They had a bunch of roofs that weren't structurally designed for the loads and they were leaking water. And so these custom battery enclosures, we really try to stay away from. Um, they, they are quite a bit of headache. And as we'll get into, there's a lot of uh, fire safety concerns kind of with the lithium ion batteries uh, in general. So these batteries as well, sorry, the earlier batteries were nickel, cobalt, manganese batteries. Uh, that, those were the most kind of commercially viable uh, battery cells at the time. Um, we do have a lot of other NCM batteries. I think what we've seen is a lot of the providers, like the EV providers, uh, have migrated to more lithium iron phosphate. Um, chemistries. And so they have slightly less energy density uh, per kilogram. Um, and just volume wise, like they're about 90% the energy density of NCM batteries, uh, but they have better thermal uh, characteristics. And, you know, that that pretty much limits kind of um, the scenario most concerned, which is kind of thermal runaway and, um, you know, uncontrolled off-gassing, hydrogen off-gassing, basically creates, uh, creating an explosive gas environment. Uh, we, we believe uh, so from the science we've seen that the lithium iron phosphate battery is a little more safe from a fire safety perspective. Um, and so that, that's the other thing with these containers. This was all pre uh, UL 9540, which is when there was a standardized listing um, you know, underwriter laboratories came out with a listing. I think there's a CEC equivalent for you guys up in Canada. Uh, I forget what that standard actually is. I think it makes reference to UL 9540. Uh, but these, in, these in containers are basically not compliant with all of those um, standard specifications that are required from a fire, fire safety perspective today. They do have fire alarming systems, heat and smoke detection systems, but they're kind of more rudimentary design. Uh, relative to some, some other solutions we'll point out today. So this was my uh, COVID baby, as you can see by the masks here. Uh, this this was uh, effectively uh, Miramar Top Gun was kind of a, 
it was supposed to be a rinse and repeat of Fallbrook. Just because of the timeline difference, it was it was kind of vastly different. We went with a different EBC contractor uh, for this particular site, but this was still in um, you know engineered Connex shipping container uh, solutions. Uh, this one did uh, utilize power electronic inverters, uh, which you can't see. They're kind of out of frame on the left-hand side there. Um, close couple to the, the transformer. So the inverter is external to the um, the, the battery enclosures. Uh, but we did, did get a UL9540 listing for field listing for these containers. Um, and it, it was a very challenging exercise to kind of go through that uh, certification process. Uh, these were Samsung batteries, still NCM batteries. Um, uh, that's pretty much kind of uh, the next generation. And this is where I did a lot of, of my personal learning to kind of understand how best to go about implementing and, and designing these systems. These were 40 foot connexes. And so the unique thing about the, the shipping containers is you, you, if you, you can't preload them with all the batteries because you'll violate a lot of the DOT, uh, the Department of Transportation weight restrictions. These things fully loaded get over 100,000 pounds, uh, the 40 foot connexes the structural frame has to be designed to like, you know, bend under that weight. Uh, we've got these particular gray beam runners for this, this site. Um, but it's kind of more reason just because the logistics of shipping battery modules separate from the container and the QAQC of field installing batteries where a lot of damage is easy to occur in that scenario. We, we've tried to get away from that and go to a more modular form factor uh, for our sites. And so um, this is the Fallbrook energy storage uh, system. Uh, this is kind of the Fluence cube topology uh, where they put these, um, you know, the, these modular uh, enclosures that are just two racks each. Those connexes on the last slide are effectively um, I think there are 28 racks in each one of those. And so the, the rack being kind of a very typical form factor, you know, you have uh, very similar offerings from a lot of different battery uh, storage vendors where you basically have all of uh, your, you know, about 20 to 28 cells strung in parallel in a module. And the modules are stacked and strung in um, series to, get to anywhere between 900 and 1500 volts DC for the rack level. And that's kind of your smallest controllable, you know, battery unit um, that that's just dispatchable or isolatable via DC contactors at the top of the rack. Um, and you string all those together to whatever your power conversion, you know, block size is. So, you know, if you've got, a four megawatt hour block you tie to a one MVA inverter. You got a you got a four hour system, a, a 0.25 C rated system there. Uh, this particular site uh, is designed for augmentation as well, and so all these cubes here, uh, this fluence offering is kind of unique in in that they can shuffle these cubes around and effectively to augment the site. They just install new cubes and connect them to DC bus bars that go across the top of the cubes. Um, so it's kind of novel in that design. Um, we'll get some better looks at the cubes on the other side. Here's some more Fallbrook. We actually had to build a, a substation uh, to interconnect it. It was our first transmission interconnected one. So typical for any large scale generator, right? Had to build a GSU substation. So I had a little bit more going on. So definitely a learning experience for myself there. And then a lot more prohibitive from just an interconnection uh, facility uh, installation timeframe and permitting timeframe, right? Uh, this site was also on a greenfield site. It was it was an industrial zone site, but you know we had to go through the whole uh, county process for minor use permit um, and all the corresponding kind of authority uh, having jurisdiction requirements. Uh, so uh, definitely more challenging than building on some of the uh, SDG permitted substation properties that we've done some of the other projects on. And then here's uh, Westside, which has just been recently mechanically complete. So we are basically mechanically complete, I think, really in December. Uh, we got the substation and switchyard mechanically complete, which you can kind of see here at the far end of the photo. Uh, it's a 230 uh, kV 
230,000 volt substation and switch yard that ties into a Gentai on the far side of the property there. We got that all done in early February of this year. And ever since uh, we've achieved that back feed, we've been kind of undergoing the site commissioning and energization. We have done full charge and discharge as of four weeks ago. And this again is that modular uh, uh, fluence energy design. There's a lot of other vendors that kind of have conformed to this uh, modular form factor. Um, I think some of the, the Powin products, which are I think more common up in Canada, Terragen, uh, the LS power stuff, they're kind of going in this direction. Uh, they're non-occupiable spaces, so they're safe, kind of safer from a, we think they're safer from a, an operations perspective um, and maintenance perspective. Uh, they have deflagration panels on the top. They have integrated aerosol statics canisters that are you know, passively uh, suppress, you know, electrical fires, um, you know, with, with heat output. Uh, they're not rated to output a uh, thermal runaway situation for the actual module. So that's, that's a common misunderstood thing in the industry. You know, like, like a Tesla that gets in a car accident and sets on fire. Um, there's not much you can really do from a suppression standpoint. Uh, both foam and water uh, suppression actually agitates the thermal runaways in a lot of situations and can just worsen uh, the plastics fire that is effect effectively taking place. And so you, the, the whole edict and what we're instructing our emergency responders uh, to do if we were ever have a battery fire, which we have not had yet to date, knock on wood, um, is basically to stand by uh, and isolate the system and just make sure that adjacent facilities don't light on fire. Um, and so that that is something uh, we're, we're constantly struggling and trying to improve uh, upon uh, to look for better solutions and look for solutions that have more built in, uh, really it comes down to how you operate and monitor these systems uh, and the automation built around that, right? We're, we're bringing in thousands of cell temperatures, cell voltages, um, environmental ambient conditions, the HVAC alarms to ensure that we're not losing any of the subsystems or any of the subsystems aren't getting out of, uh, you know, an environmental condition, you know, ambient temperature condition that would, would jeopardize safety and, and, and cause a thermal runaway event. Um, that's something, again, where the industry is still getting its hands around on and, and really working to improve. Um, and so we're kind of right there with it. Um, that being said, uh, you know, here's some of the just like high level arrangement drawings. There's a whole phase two for this project. Phase one is effectively just what you saw in that last photo is this one here, uh, RWE, the, you know, um, the developer for this particular site, you know, they're looking to build a, a phase two, um, either as a merchant or to sell some to some other providers. So they're going to be interconnecting another 200 megawatts to that same uh, switch yard. Uh, this one had a pretty significant GSU. For most of our sites, we like to use switch gear, but this one, we did a lot of air insulated, uh, you know, bus work and vacuum uh, pad mounted circuit breakers, keep things pretty affordable for the site. Um, everything on the low side is 34 and a half thousand volt, uh, medium voltage interconnection. Effectively for each one of those DC blocks and on the inverter side, you're close coupling to the low side of the transformer is at like anywhere between 600 and 690 volts is typical. And then you're stepping up to that 34 and a half thousand volts on what we call the balance of plant system. It's just a spider web of MV cabling uh, that goes throughout the site and daisy chains uh, to and from each transformer to be, be, able, be able to connect and charge and discharge all these uh, subsystems at once. Um, yeah, and they, they are physically isolatable and bypassable. So if you ever needed to isolate one of the cores to continue to operate the other uh, cores on that string, uh, you could you could do so from a system availability standpoint. Um, here is just an arrangement drawing kind of showing that the MV cable is kind of daisy chaining to and from each one of these 
transformers and the you know kind of the various foundations that are on throughout the site a uh, lot of below grade conduit a lot of uh concrete to support these heavy heavy structures so again here's kind of a closer up view of of this fluence uh modular design um and some of the below grade you know accommodations you have to make you have all the dc conduit connections um not not shown here you have these are all the auxiliary power connections and you have some calm connections uh fiber and ethernet uh to uh each one of these cores so they have three nodes in each core they show four here uh for whatever reason in their standard uh kind of o m manual photo but there's three of these on the typical um form factor they have, which we've used both EPC inverters or power electronics. They're 4.2 MVA or four megawatt roughly uh, inverter blocks. And so they've got three different DC buses in those units and they're able to individually control the node, which is that entire string of cubes. Uh, and that DC bus bars again, go across the top to kind of connect to all of them. So it's a positive and negative on each side. They hit these cube row termination cabinets here and they cable from that to the inverter um but basically yeah you're you're controlling the dc voltage across all of those cubes via one inverter and so you're charging and discharging by raising and lowering voltage uh on that dc bus system um and and yeah you can isolate each you know either rack in each cube or the cube itself from that bus and continue operations with a subset of the cubes um, what we find and is, is more difficult from an augmentation standpoint, right? Each one of these systems will lose about 2% of energy capacity per year. Uh, if we were to operate them one full depth of discharge per day. So if we fully charge and discharge it per day, we would expect around 2% year of capacity loss. So for this particular system, we're, we're, right around 530 megawatt hours of capacity, we'd expect to lose roughly eight megawatt hours of capacity every year. And we will be installing new cubes and new nodes to effectively offset that and maintain, you know, our contracted capacity with sdg &E energy supply, um, which, which will maintain our resource adequacy requirements. Um, so with that said, I'm going to kind of just stop there. I'm going to exit so I can actually see the chat. Great. I um, thanks for that, Jay. We've got some so, some really good questions coming in. I can I can kind of start uh, pushing them over to you. Um, you know, I, I know there's some more technical questions, but I think that this will be one that you know is on everyone's mind. Um, you know, has energy storage reduced rate wear costs in San Diego? So just kind of wondering how strong are the economics and how much are they still changing? Yeah, so it's it, it's it's tough because so the, the proper response is obviously energy storage uh, is more expensive than conventional uh, generation. Right. And so, uh, you know, with that said, Generation costs have dramatically gone up for for California uh, ratepayers and, and and customers, uh, not just because of energy storage. It's actually a function of what was going on in the generation market prior to energy storage. So there's a lot of other things going on that have just driven costs higher. Um, you've had the decommissioning, particularly in our region of San Onofre Nuclear Generation Station. We lost two gigawatts there. Uh, Otai. Uh, Otai Mesa power plant was con uh, another Rankin style natural gas plant, lost its permit. I think I was 1.5 uh, gigawatts or just over a gigawatt capacity. Um, Encina, which was a 750 megawatt capacity, got replaced with Carlsbad Energy Center, which is only 330 megawatts. And so you're just losing a lot of um, capacity across the system a lot of municipalities or the public utilities commission wasn't uh, renewing permits for these conventional power plants to try to force us and, and, and the markets to kind of adopt other newer, cleaner uh, generation capacity. Right. 
But the problem is if you tear it down first and build the other assets second, it, you, you, you're basically creating an emergency, right? And so we've seen prices kind of go up because you have less capacity and we see these insane pricing events and during our heat waves. Um, and, and then that's created an emergency where now these batteries do make sense because that, that resource adequacy costs uh, per KW year is getting up to the upper 100s, right? And so just from a capacity perspective, you know, a megawatt of capacity is worth, you know, $1.5 million or something like that, you know? Uh, those are just ballpark numbers. And then it definitely pencils out for energy storage in that scenario. Now, we've proposed other generation. I'm on the ut utility development side. So we kind of are fired off, uh, fire firewalled off from the procurement side that makes the decisions about what costs, uh, what projects and what technologies are more cost effective and what generation buckets they need to fill. Uh, but there's, there's no question that some of the rulemaking has been oriented away with the, the Public Utilities Commission to favor renewable uh, resources and energy storage resource because the energy storage resources basically allow the increased penetration of solar and wind um, and, and some of the other geothermal and hydro, right, um, that, that we have. And so they're viewed as kind of playing a system. They, they, they get analyzed as some, you know, with some portion of carbon footprint offset costs. Um, but, you know, side by side, I, I, I couldn't tell you with a straight face that this is like, you know, on a megawatt hour base or megawatt basis is cheaper than a natural gas plant. If you had a guaranteed natural gas price over a certain time frame, right? Um, that being said, it's getting us to uh, some of this uh, SB uh, 30, uh, which, you know, basically is a Senate bill, California, that requires us to get to 100% renewable by like 2045. Like th there's, there's, uh, we know we need to change our generation mix to decarbonize. I think the question is, how do we do that cost effectively? Um, I think there's a lot of uh, varying opinions. I think, you know, what I can say about our projects is that we comp one competitive solicitation against other all resource RFOs. So they were cost effective relative to the other new generation options that were offered at that particular time. Um, but, you know, relative to the megawatt hour cost coming out of plants that are existing, probably not cheaper. Okay. Um, can you speak to the ongoing maintenance and, and just how they vary between the, the battery types or vendors? Absolutely. Um, so maintenance is a, a huge thing that we're ramping up and refocusing on asset management. Uh, we've only had a couple of these systems, right? So we sign uh, long-term service agreements. We will not buy one of these projects or the equipment without a long-term service agreement for that equipment. We need to ensure that they have the ability, the resources, and the staff to, to maintain the equipment. Uh, the thing about batteries that there's a misconception is, is they're super simple. It's just you turn them on, you turn them off, charge and discharge. Well, the, the inverters in particular... Um, and, and, and the BMS, you know, depends how you integrate uh, via your EMS design, your energy management system design, and your overall controllers. But if the, if the integration isn't elegant, uh, you're going to have a lot of nuisance tripping. You're going to have racks tripping offline, going out of balance. Um, if for whatever reason you're not consistently charging and discharging the batteries, you see voltage deviations happen, and then they get out of balance, and then they will disconnect themselves as well. Uh, we have a lot of just nuisance tripping on the inverters uh, from different grid conditions or uh, system conditions. And so a lot of manual inverter resets need to take place where someone actually remotes into the system and, and resets the inverter. Um, they require constant oversight. And so that's something I'm adamant about with our generation operations team is we, we're trying to get to the point where we're having eyes on every single one of these assets at least once a day, even if it's not running or a bid is not accepted for that asset to operate such that we're making sure the system's available and nothing is, is going offline and the system is ready um, because we do have a lot of subsystem uh, availability issues on some of the early generation sites. Now, with the later generation, right, as you would expect, the inverter manufacturer is getting better, the battery provider is getting better, the, the integration software is getting better. That's really the key. 
Um, but uh, maintenance is super crucial. You got uh, uh, HVAC on these. These are all liquid cooled as well. I didn't speak to that. The earlier products all air cooled. And so the liquid cooled units, you know, what's really advantageous about them, right? When you have these modules with 26 cells in them, it's really hard to get cool air in the center of that module. Whereas a liquid cooled unit, you can kind of ensure the ubiquitous uh, temperature control for all the same cells. And so on the air cool units, you would have more degradation and wear and tear on the cells in the middle versus the outside of the rack or the ones that are closer to the HVAC outputs. Um, uh, but HVAC maintenance is a huge priority, right? As soon as you're seeing HVAC alarms um, or temperature deviances, you, you got to truck roll uh, to kind of like recover that asset. You disconnect it uh, to make sure you're not going to overheat any of the units. A lot of the, the warranty parameters for the batteries are very restrictive, right? You will lose your warranty if the batteries just sit out there in the desert without without uh, temperature control. Uh, What's the life expectancy? So typical life expectancy, uh, we we expect all the science points to, we, we should really be able to have these things operating for 15 years. Uh, we have all our LTSAs. We have a couple 20 year LTSAs, but uh, most of them, the bulk of them are 10 year LTSAs. And so the battery uh, manufacturers really, again, circle, uh, most of them have gotten consensus around that 2% per year degradation. And after 15 years, that gets you to 70% state of health. But after that, they, they, they will not underwrite or guarantee kind of the performance of the system. Um, we kind of expect, you know, for older vintage batteries, you know, you're, you're going to get more uh, voltage deviances and nuisance tripping, right? It's going to become more and more difficult to maintain the system's uh, full availability. Uh, but that's a key thing too, is that when you augment the system, you have to keep the same vintage batteries with each other. It makes, a, it's, it's very advantageous. It's almost a necessity to do that because if you mix new batteries with old batteries on the same DC bus, you're effectively going to overwork your new batteries because those, those old batteries have less capacity. Um, and so you'll be charging them and discharging them at a higher C rate and, and you'll have higher wear and tear on those batteries. And so that's, we have all these augmentation plans where you have to like mix and match basically the, the same vintage batteries and the, and the, on the same DC nodes. Right. We are at time, but maybe we'll just take a few more questions just because we've, we've had a few more come in. Um, just, you know, as a follow a bit to what you've just shared, Jay, is, is it likely that existing battery sites will be repowered at the end of life? Yeah, absolutely. So that's my number one hope. And I think it, 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 it just pencils out really well. A lot of the cost for these facilities is in that the interconnection costs, the, the uh, balance of plant costs, the site costs. And so these facilities are arranged in such a way that the real hope is the foundation the pad mount transformers, which are 25 year, right? We all, we're all familiar with pad mount transformers and utility biz. They last 25 to 50 years, right? That all the MV cabling, the pad mount transformer, even the comms cables like to these nodes will be reusable and the foundations will be reusable. You just take the old assets off and put the new assets on, connect it up, recommission it up, same control shelter, uh, same network equipment potentially, and you, you're off to the races, right? And so if you're able to do that, you effectively cut the cost of a, you know, a new facility. You're probably somewhere in the, the 40% cost, maybe even 30% of what the overall facility, the integrated facility cost was to repower these projects uh, to get brand new batteries. And the hope is that energy density is kind of increased by that time, right? Maybe you have some novel... Um, you know, alternative chemistry uh, come online by that time. But that is absolutely uh, the hope with these facilities uh, and the plan. Okay. Um, another question from the same participant, just um, asking how many cycles per year are the SDGE batteries typ typically operating and uh, what percentage of the time are the batteries charging? Right on. Um, so uh, I was talking to our, our trading folks yesterday and basically what they, what they informed us recently was interesting. Uh, 
there's a lot of uh, bidding complications with the batteries, right? So they're kind of getting their hands wet uh, or dirty with just, you know, kind of getting better at bidding these things in. And, you know, each of the systems have some unique bidding parameters, um, whether it be round trip efficiency differences or um, uh, variable own M that's assigned to the, uh, the service agreement. So different costs uh, parameters, but effectively what they admitted was they're getting better at it. And they, they recently did a, a relook at their Plexos modeling and they were potentially leaving some money on the table and these things uh, just from a, an algorithm error they had in their, in their bidding uh, platform. But that being said, relative to that one cycle uh, depth of discharge per day, uh, 365 days per year, we're seeing about 60 to 75% of that throughput. So what we've contracted for, we're, we're kind of underutilizing them a little bit. And it's probably again, cause there's been, been some difficulties around getting our hands around how best to bid them. But that that's kind of where we see uh, the, the most average system is kind of in that 60 to 70% range of, of that contracted throughput. So, you know, you nameplate the system 40 megawatt or say 100 megawatt hours, 365, uh, sorry, 36,500 megawatt hours per year. You're getting somewhere in that, you know, 28,000 megawatt hour range, uh, megawatt hour uh, range. So, yeah. Okay, great. Thank you. Well, I will we'll maybe just try and fit one more question in here um, before we, we let everyone go. Um, you know, you had touched on kind of the, you know, the challenges or risks around fire. Um, we have one question come in that given that possible fire containment is focused on isolation and protecting adjacent development, are there existing setbacks for battery um, installations? setbacks yeah. yeah i think uh you know the big thing is just permitting right like the, they are fire hazards right so like in, in a permitting standpoint that's got to be contemplated um you, you can't just build these wherever uh having said that we have a lot of sites where we you know we're building kind of on substation property close to residences you know but we're just accommodating to have the appropriate setbacks access um Fire monitoring and alarm systems, that's kind of a no brainer, but you know, just, um, and then water suppression access. Um, uh oh, I'm getting cut off here. Oops. Sorry. Uh, I know, as long as you can still hear me, I can uh, still hear you. Right on. Uh, but yeah, the big thing is just kind of having appropriate setbacks and access roads so that you can, you can get a fire truck in on a fire uh, access road that's weight rated for a fire truck to be able to isolate and contain the situation. Uh, you don't want to press these things up against buildings. Uh, you, you can avoid 99% of like kind of catastrophic outcomes by just siting them properly and doing the appropriate spacing, right? And that those, those are outlined in some of the NFPA uh, 855 requirements. Great. Well, thank you so much, Jay. Um, you know, there is a, you know, a few more questions left there in the chat, but um, we should probably wrap up and um, just want to thank everybody for attending. And um, if you do have more questions that you want uh, to submit um, at the ask a question feature over at sasspower.com uh, slash engage. And you will have noticed um, a little survey popped up and we totally appreciate people um, providing the feedback um, on the event. And, and, and I really appreciate all your time and attention. I'll, I'll probably just plug away a couple answers to the Q&A uh, via text there Great. in the chat. Um, but yeah, hit us up if you guys have any more questions. Uh, we know a lot of, again, partner utilities are looking at this stuff. Uh, so we, we like everyone to be well educated so they, they can go in uh, and, and do things smoothly because there's a lot of growing pains with the, the new systems. Wonderful. And again, I'll just remind everyone that if they want to um, come back and, you know, take in part of Jay's uh, presentation or any of the sessions that you maybe didn't get a chance to get to today, um, those will be up in the replay section on this platform within about two days from now and um, up for two weeks following that. So people can take those in and, and uh, share the information. So thanks again for joining us.